My name is Paul Hilton. I'm a conservation photojournalist and I've spent the last 20 years documenting wildlife crime across the globe. From the jungles of Asia to the shark fin markets in Taiwan, exposing the atrocities of the pangolin trade. From Africa to the border areas of Laos, Myanmar and Thailand in the Golden Triangle. I report from the front lines, tracking wildlife crime and acting as a voice for the voiceless. But it's a job that sometimes comes with huge risk. Putting my life on the line to expose criminals profiting from this savage industry. And in those quiet moments when I take a photograph, I try to connect with that animal. I can almost feel their fate. But it really doesn't have to be like this. Biodiversity creates ecosystems that maintain the balance of all life. It affects the air we breathe, the water we drink, and the food we eat. Throughout my career, I've always tried to illustrate the scale of what we as a species are up against. My intentions are to move people to act, to become part of the solution. We are en route to one of the planet's last true wild places, to meet those on the front lines of defense for some of the most spectacular biodiversity. Join us on this journey as we explore the last wild places. We visit wildlife crime hotspots and meet the people that can give us first-hand information on what's really happening on the ground. On the island of Sumatra, Indonesia, the Losa ecosystem is the last place on Earth where tiger, rhino, elephant and orangutan coexist under the same canopy. From high mountain forests, tropical lowlands to carbon-rich peat swamps. As one of the world's biodiversity hotspots, this area has a critical role in regulating the Earth's climate and it is currently under threat. From conflict palm oil expansion, canals are dug to drain the forest of life. At the same time, logging takes place. Fires are lit, allowing poachers to go deeper into the forest and going after its iconic species. And then land conversion takes place, increasing human-wildlife conflict in surrounding communities. Come with us to one of the last great forests of Asia, where we come face to face with one of our closest living relatives. And we discover the beauty and the threats and how global conservation is helping to fight the war in nature. Weezer, a Sumatran elephant caught in the snare. I can't believe it. Okay, okay, we'll get over there as soon as we can. Okay, thanks. Okay, bye now. I first met Weezer back in 2012 when I just won a World Press Award on the shark fin trade. When her and a colleague reached out to me to see if I'd like to document illegal palm oil expansion taking place in the incredible Losa ecosystem. They wanted me to help raise the profile of this critical habitat globally. At the time, I really had no idea about the Losa ecosystem. They took me to the front lines where I documented and witnessed crimes against the planet. The Trooper Peat Swamp was being cleared at an alarming rate. The land was stripped of everything. All I can remember is traveling for hours and hours along dirt roads and just seeing palm oil. The plantations just went on and on. And when we finally reached a small patch of forest, there he was, a young male orangutan, refusing to leave his home forest. A team from Sumatran Orangutan Conservation Program called him Avatar. Avatar needed to be tranquilized and relocated to a bigger block of forest. After several hours of seeing Avatar pull darts out of his body and sucking out the tranquilizer, the team finally succeeded. Avatar fell from the treetops. He was still conscious and he made eye contact with me. And at that very moment, I realized I couldn't walk away. The world needed to know the true cost of conflict palm oil.
Wiza is one of the most powerful voices in conservation, internationally recognized for her leadership role by receiving a Whitley Award in 2019, and more recently included in the Time 100. The Loiser ecosystem, 2.7 million hectares of relatively intact forests. You could look at the map of entire Sumatra and you see how it changed over the years. And Loiser is that last large intact and contiguous landscape in the entire island. This is our last hope for all of the biodiversity, for the ecosystem services that we all need. The Losa ecosystem has three major habitats supporting all of this incredible biodiversity. From misty mountain forests where trees are covered in moss, clouded leopards roam, and critically endangered rhinos travel on mountain plateaus to the tropical lowlands, which is prime tiger and elephant habitat. And finally, into the coastal peat swamps that play a fundamental role on the Earth's climate by holding an incredible amount of carbon dioxide. And that is why it has been labelled the orangutan capital of the world. Everything's just gone. How the hell are we going to bring back those trees? It's very different when you look at numbers of deforestation and you see it, you witness it up close. Look at the size of this tree. How many years are old is this tree? A pit swamp forest is essentially a patch of forest that is almost always inundated with water. They shed leaves, they shed plant matters that fall to the forest floor. And because it's constantly inundated with water, it doesn't get decomposed in the same way that it would in a lowland forest. They capture and they store a lot of carbons are essentially modern day organic matter that is yet to become oil and gas. This canal is dug to drain the life out of this swamp where they could turn it into monoculture plantation. First thing that happened is it become brittle and it become very prone to fire. Protecting the pit swamps in the Loiser ecosystem serve both the role of protection of biodiversity, but also protections for us to mitigate and adapt against climate change. First, they cut the trees, then the fires are lit to clear the land. The problem with lighting a peat swamp it keeps burning and smouldering to the point where it can be seen from space, which then affects the air quality in neighbouring countries. What makes me so angry that this is not about livelihood. This is total greed. We always talk about as the road goes through everything else follow. The forest gets cleared, the poachers move in, wildlife gets extracted. Over here in the distance is a call of the white-handed gibbon. Right across Sumatra, they're being poached for the exotic pet trade. And they have really close, tight family units and sadly the adults are being shot and killed, snared and then the, the babies, the juveniles are being taken and being trafficked across the world to the Middle East, China, even Russia for the exotic pet trade.
see the loiser ecosystem and the need for development in this landscape require large scale exploitation, they create regulations that allow that exploitation and destruction to take place. Singkil have the highest level of protection in all of Indonesia legal protection for forests. The amount of deforestation and forest destruction in the Singkil pit swamp has been increasing like never before. And these destructions are not for livelihoods. They're not done by small communities. They are done by people with capital. They are done by people that have power. So once again, communities getting exploited. Yeah, and getting blamed. Making other people rich, at the cost of their environment, the cost of their economic sustainable future. And what do they end up with? Water table drops. Yeah, and some of them end up working on palm oil plantations, but from what I've read, a majority of them are getting pay underpaid anywhere from 60 to 80 dollars a month for a six day week. Yeah. And then they go poaching to... Yeah, supplement their income. What yeah. kind of living is that? Send the kids to school, they just can't afford it. Yeah, and they continue to get trapped in that cycle of poverty. The communities might get nothing. They'll get pushed out of the land, they'll lose their source of livelihood, and they lose their connection to the ecosystem services that have sustained them their autonomy and their economic independence. They become dependent on palm oil companies. They work for them for tiny, meager wages and probably could never escape that cycle of poverty. Do you see this um, palm oil truck in front of us? Yeah. Yeah, they just been at the mail to pick up the crude palm oil and then on his way to a refinery. And then it's literally pretty much in, what, 50, 60% of products on the supermarket shelf, is it? Yeah, pretty much, yeah. So it's not as if we can't do without it. I think it's not necessarily that we need to cut out palm oil in a sense, but rather to engage and stop them from clearing so much for us. The community who own palm oil plantation are very dependent on the palm oil mill. Because once they harvest, this fresh fruit bunch doesn't last long. They have to sell it straight away. It doesn't matter what the market price is. The mill decide what they will be paying for this palm oil. Because they are at the mercy of the palm oil mill, they never get the fair price. A whole lot of communities that we work with ended up switching their livelihood because they got to a point of realizing that this is not economically sustainable for me. If I grow petai, if I grow durian, if I grow jengkol, that brings me more livelihood than if I grow palm oil. We're looking at fresh clearing, primary forests of secondary forests turned into plantations. Okay, and this is what it looks like before the trees go in? Essentially, you come in, you cut down all the forests, turn the land into concessions, into a plantation. And what happens to orangutans and wildlife in this situation? As you can see, there's no orangutan that could survive on this patch of land. It's like a wasteland. It is a bit like a wasteland. Migration routes of elephants that have been used for thousands of years pass through these small communities and now crops and livestock are grown where forests once stood and now tigers within the area will also be affected. When it comes to living alongside wildlife, there's always going to be challenges. 
And when deforestation and land clearing happens, there's going to be an increase in human wildlife conflict. If a community has a conflict tiger, they'll come in, they'll set up one of these traps, hopefully catch the tiger before it's killed by the locals because of human wildlife conflict. They'll catch the tiger and then relocate into a different part of the forest. And as we push into deeper into the forest through deforestation and palm oil plantations, we're opening up the tiger habitat and wildlife conflict is increasing constantly. Conflict kills not only human and wildlife, but ultimately, wildlife pays the price. As these forests get opened up, it makes easy access for the poachers to go deeper into the forest. After the phone call with Weezer, I tried to get to the injured elephant as quickly as possible. This critically endangered Sumatran elephant that we called Daisy was caught in a snare between two palm oil plantations. Sadly, the herd had moved on. When I arrived, she was lying on her side in a pool of mud. A coalition of NGOs were working around the clock to feed her, administrating saline drips and giving her painkillers. The situation was really desperate. And sadly that evening, she passed away. And there's not a day that goes by, I don't think of Daisy. Global conservation supports the conservation in this area and has a no cut, no kill policy, which translates to no deforestation, prevention of poaching in the area, and supports local community. The conservation uh, landscape, you might say, is a huge thing, all the way from uh, species protection to climate change. Global conservation's focus is specifically on the park and wildlife protection, um, and that is a very under-resourced area. After speaking to some of the locals, they've had a lot of tiger interactions. So there's this is prime habitat for tigers. And you can see, standing here just feels like a frontier. You can really feel just that, that forest goes for a long way. And it's, it's quite special. It's not manicured anyway, it's wild. Uh, these rivers meander through most of the ecosystem and there's no dams. Where most places in the world, there's lots of dams. Here, it's one of the last true wild places on the planet. To protect this biodiversity hotspot for generations, global conservation is strategically supporting the local community to become guardians of the forest. Palm oil. All of it. Two years ago, I was here. There's nothing. They practically just begin restoring this area. They cut down all the oil palm and they slowly allowing forests to regenerate. But it's incredible that in two years, we got all this. Imagine what will happen in 5, 10, 15, 20. Some of the restoration could happen naturally. You just cut down the oil palm and then let forest grow back. In some cases, for the tree planting kind of restoration is necessary. One, it allows communities to make a livelihood um, out of these fruit trees and these trees are also forest compatible. So there's a lot of durians, there's a lot of uh, wood trees that would 
give forest the canopy that it needs, allowing biodiversity to come back, but also give people livelihood. Trembesi is used to restore riverbanks, and without the support from global conservation, this restoration work would not happen. Global Conservation has been funding Losa Ecosystem Conservation for over a decade. We're actually helping the countries protect their parks on the ground. So training, equipment, systems, really bringing Silicon Valley systems to third world countries and helping them save their parks. I see our conservation work as a partnership with multiple people and organizations that share this vision of protection of the Loisar ecosystem. Global conservation has been one of those important partners who trusted us, who trusted our work from the very beginning. They invested in our conservation initiatives. They trusted us, they allow us to do what we do best, to be the player on the ground. They supported our work and enabled us to sue companies, to restore forests, to build research stations, to work with the community and change how they make a living out of the forest. Well, you know about orangutan culture. Culture is knowledge that you pass down through generations. Orangutan both in Sumatra and Borneo have similar access to food, mm -hmm. but they use it differently. Mm -hmm. So imagine this is a nesia fruit. Uh -huh. Nesia exists both in Sumatra and in Kalimantan. However, the orangutan in Kalimantan does not consume them. The fruit is rock hard. It's very difficult to access. Uh -huh. When it falls to the ground and it's a bit ripe, it will open a little bit. It's not large enough for you to stick your hand and grab the fruits, but these fruits are very nutritious. Yeah. Lots of fats, lots of carbs, really good for orangutan. So the orangutan in Sumatra figured out a way that they could use a stick. Right. They could fashion a stick and they put it in their mouth and then they go flick the fruits. <laughs> really? And then they will eat it as it fall onto their mouth. And because they have access to that, they increase the population of the orangutans and they increase the density of the orangutans. So in the same patch of forest, you get more orangutan that they can observe one another. It's like collective knowledge. It's like a library in each other's head through each other's behavior. Pretty incredible, eh? Amazing. So, uh, yeah, should we keep going? Go. Oh, look. Yeah. It's a big male. It actually reminds me of Avatar. Yeah, imagine the life he's having right now. Or oh, the life he wouldn't have had if actually he wasn't rescued that day. From all that hard work in those early days, documenting the Tripa peat swamp and that illegal palm oil company that was destroying all that forest, is now finally being brought to justice. Back in 2010, this company was clearing forests without any permit. We filed a police report against them. Somehow, they managed to get away with it. And then the area that they wanted was closed off in the moratorium. But somehow, they managed to get a permit 
and managed to get the area taken out from the moratorium as if the permit was legal, even though it was clearly illegal. While we were suing them in court, they have the guts to just burn the forest. We were furious, we were so angry. And luckily, so many people was angry with us. The government went down on them, the Ministry of Environment sued them. It was the first ever case on using criminal and civil lawsuit against a palm oil company that burned forests. So in the past, anytime there is forest fires, government tend to look for the person who lit the fire. But in the case of PT Kalista Alam, government actually held the company liable for the land that is within the concession. It was record-breaking. When the announcement in court, the verdict came down, the judges said the Kalista Alam was guilty and they need to pay fine, they need to pay restoration costs, and this is going to create a precedent throughout the country against all palm oil companies that were burning for us. That celebration comes a little too early. The company fought back. They don't want to be paying the fine. They don't want to be paying restoration costs. And we keep pushing a decade on. We were still in court with them. Last week, we had the most amazing news. The company began to pay fines. And it speaks to the persistence of everyone involved. Thousands of petition signers. Thousands of letters. Thousands of photos, tweets. Thousands of hours goes into making sure this case a move forward. And now after 10 years, the rogue palm oil company, Callista Alarm, is having to pay $23 million in fines and restoration costs. A lot of people get really angry about palm oil and what it does to the rainforest of Indonesia, to the rainforest of the world. The solution is not to boycott palm oil. The way I see it, palm oil is just a commodity. But if we use the same kind of greed in operating our companies, whatever commodities that we choose, it will just be as destructive. So I don't think we should be boycotting palm oil. More than anything, I think we should engage with them. As a consumer, you could demand companies to have clear traceability. Demand that from companies. Don't stop talking to them. I think for me, the solution is quite simple. We need a collaboration between government, businesses, communities, conservation um, initiatives, the global communities. I think we need different kind of economic opportunities for people living outside the Loisar ecosystem. I think we need more research to better understand this landscape. I think there is so much opportunity that we are not utilizing by conserving this landscape. We need to shift the economic opportunities in this landscape from exploitation into conservation initiatives. I think a lot of us could begin to think about this landscape in the way forward. The long-term protection would offer ecosystem services through water security, topsoil retention, flood mitigation, and ultimately a huge carbon sink. We can't afford to lose the Losa ecosystem. Forests around the world are shrinking. We all need to wake up and do this together. Out of 2.7 million hectares, 
80% of this landscape is still intact. I have a lot of hope that we could change the situation, that we could flip the game and make it better. Despite only covering 2% of the world's surface, these rainforests hold 50% of the world's biodiversity and hold 25% of the world's carbon in the soil and in the trees. And the health of our planet depends on these rainforests like the Losa ecosystem. And the key to the protection of these forests is by empowering local community to reverse forest loss, stop deforestation, stop poaching, so we can all work together for a thriving planet.